You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But I'm not going to always be in this type of that. You know, the old saints would say, there's a leak in this house. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my soul got down. See, 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 you could be in a body for so long. And, you know, I, I saw a meme the other day. said, this can't be the same memes I used to do the Tootsie Roll to. Oh, man, y'all know that. I'm not talking about the king. No, no, no. That's your baby. That's your baby. That's your baby. But there was a time when you could do some things. Amen. Amen. You can do it now. You can try to do it now if you want to. You can call it that flat. Amen. Call it in the work. Get your knee brace or something. So we have to understand, brothers and sisters, this is inevitable. That's my point. And so the Bible says the whole creation, God created this because of one man's sin. I want you to look quickly at Romans chapter 5, verse 12. This is how it began. This is, this is Paul's synopsis of what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 gives us a shortcut, if you will. He says there, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death, watch this, passed unto all men. For all have sin. He didn't say y'all have sin. He said all have sin. That says to me that you and I have death in us. John chapter 3, you've heard me say this many times, verse number 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But then you go down to verse 18, the Bible says, And Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world. He says, But if you do not believe, you are condemned already. That is in the present tense. That means that death and condemnation is on you already. Oh, preacher, I just, I'm not ready to give my life to the Lord. I'm not ready to get baptized yet for the remission of my sins. Uh, just give me some time. Let me tell you something. Death doesn't have a problem. You, you can, now you know you can point, you can say, listen here, I want to go to the eye doctor this Thursday at 9 o'clock, call him and say, I need an eye appointment at 9 o'clock Thursday. And you might get it. But when it comes to death, death ain't going to take you on the shoulder and say, hey, don't come in uh, 2021, June the 1st, you need to get ready. Amen? We don't know what death is. I tell you what, you go ask some folks in the grave right now, are they ready to die when they die? And I guarantee you, none of them, none of them will say yes. You know why? Because nobody knows what death is. But we do know what's coming. And I don't want to depress you this morning. I, I want to inform you this morning. I want to inform your spirit that since you don't know what death is, it's time to get right with God while you still have life. Amen. And the minute you say to yourself, well, I'll put it off another day, is when death gets closer to you. You don't believe me. You're closer to death today than you were yesterday. Amen. Now, I don't know when your death is. I hope it's long, long, long away. I'm a fairly young preacher, but I've done a few, few funerals. And, and I've done some funerals of people that did not expect to die. So I can tell you, death is a constant companion. But brothers and sisters, I want you to see something else. Verse 21 of Romans chapter 8. It says, because the, cre the creature of creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Let me read from the New Living Translation. The creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. What the Lord is trying to show us here is that even creation is looking forward to the time that you and I are manifesting. The Bible gives us salvation in three stages. The first stage is what they call justification. It means just as if I never sinned. That's called justification. The way you get justification is when you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's when Jesus comes and takes away 
Lord's sins. That's called justification. Nobody is justified in the eyes of God without Jesus. You can cry all you want to. You can touch as many TV screens as you want to. You can pay to go to any conference you want to. You are not going to be justified until you do what God says to do. Part two of that is what's called sanctification. The word sanctification means to set apart. When you're justified, God says, now I've got to use you for my will. He puts you apart from everything else. Some of us are justified, but we don't look like we're sanctified. Because we're doing the same thing everybody else is doing. God says, when you are justified, then you go through a state of sanctification. And we are, who are in the body of Christ, we are now in sanctification. We are being sanctified every day. I'm not sinless, but I should be saying less. Amen. I'm not where I need to be, but I need to be closer today than I was yesterday. I should be able to say like Paul, no, I have not attained. I press it toward the mark of the high calling. Paul could say, I'm not perfect, but I'm, I'm pressing. And as long as I'm pressing and as long as I'm looking at the goal, God will give me the internal strength, the spiritual strength to meet the goal. Brothers and sisters, he says, the whole creation is looking forward to that day. He says, because it also is in the bondage of corruption. It also is in this tied up situation. He says in verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pain of childbirth together until now. Isn't that beautiful? You know, the Bible uses childbirth and child pain to describe what we are going through. It, it is, I, I've never given birth to children, so I can't speak uh, from a personal perspective, but when, when a mother, I've been told, when a mother has a child, and when she's trying to give birth, it hurts. But there's an expectancy to that child. That expectancy says, you know what, even though I'm going through some pain now, I'm praying to God, give me a healthy child. And I'm willing to go through that pain. I'm willing to say, God, if I got to go through this to get that, then I'll go through it. And that's what he pictures the world doing. He says the entire creative world is straining, it's groaning, it's a childbirth. And he says we're doing it together. He's saying what you go through, I'm going through. The pain I'm feeling, Brother Garland, I'm feeling it too. And even though we go through pains that might be different, we all going through some pain. He says, but guess what? We got hope. That's the most beautiful thing in the world. We got hope. Hope doesn't mean wishful thinking. It means I've got confidence. And you're going to see this in just a second. He's going to say, I've got confidence that what I have, I can't see right now. See, when you go through those struggles in life and you say, Lord, I don't know if you're going to put me out of this one. This, this is some, some deep problems. I don't know if I'm going to be able to escape this issue. What you have to remember is that you got hope. You got hope. And let me help you. If you work, amen, you come to work on time, amen, you do your job, amen. Uh, some of us don't, that's why I got a call. <laughs> and, and there's some hope that you're going to get a paycheck on payday. Is that all right? Amen. I'm trying, I'm trying to make this thing plain. Y'all looking like y'all don't understand what I'm trying to say. You got some hope. And, and you know what you do? You look forward to paying some bills off, don't you? You look forward to saying, I'm going to Red Lobster. I'm going to get some little cheddar biscuits. I'm, I'm eating McDonald's now, but I'm going to be eating Red Lobster next week. Praise the Lord. I can't afford Christian Louboutin this month, but you give me three pictures and watch the Red Lobster come out of that box. Amen. And it's, you, you got some hope because there's something about hope that makes you happy. You don't have it now, but there's hope that you'll have it in the future. Spiritually speaking, you should be the happiest person in the world. You're a child of God. You've got something the world doesn't have. The, the world looks for what you have, and the world tries to manufacture what you have, but what 
you have going beyond what the world has. You can find men like Steve Jobs, billionaire, not happy. Jeffrey Epstein, billionaire, not happy. So I think it's the money that's going to be happy. I just tell us, oh, I can mean, I mean, just like, be a millionaire. Lord, I know I can, I can serve you better. <laughs> God give you a raise on your paycheck. You just as slim as you want to be. Amen. <laughs> Oh, you it must be a ten dollar oh, I didn't know you know what I mean? Give me ten dollars, I'll give eight dollars, give me seven. I'll give you. <laughs> Don't fool yourself, that's my point. Now look at verse 22. The Bible says, For we know that the whole creation groaned and travailed in pain together until now. Then he goes on to say, and not only they, but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grow within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to the wit, the redemption of our body. Let me read that from the New Living Translation. He says in verse 123, he says, and we believers also grow, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children. In the Jewish culture, adoption was not something that was done often, but in the Greco-Roman world, adoption was very commonplace. So Paul pulls from this million. He says, if you understand the Greco-Roman uh, adoption process, you'll understand that the father has what's called material potestas, complete, uh, complete utter control of the family. In this sense, he controls every aspect of life in that family. If he told uh, someone that he wanted to kill his child, there was nothing they could do because the father in the Roman culture had complete control of the family. In some cultures, because the father did not have a, a son, he only had daughters, he may not have any children at all, he would sometimes do what's called adoption. He would adopt a child that was not his biologically, and he would give that child all the rights of the father. But what they would have to do in cases where a child was adopted from another family that had another man, there would be two what they call pateria potestas, complete control. So they would have to do what's called a mansipatio. Mansipatio was the process in which uh, the father would buy the son and sell the son and buy the son and sell the son twice, and he would do it a third time and he would not buy the son back. That was emblematic of the fact that now that son becomes a family, a family member of another family. After that process of mansipatio, there was another one called Vindicatio, which means that they would have to take the legal document to a Roman magistrate to make sure that everything was done properly and they would then officially adopt that child. What the Bible is showing us is that Paul pulls from this video and says, what God is doing is he's taking you and I who are sinners, who are not his son biologically, our spirit. And he said, I'm going to make you, who are a sinner, part of my family. Yeah. Mm, this is good. And I'm going to do it through spiritual adoption. Yeah. So now, you may not be the son of God, but now you're sons of God. Yeah. Mm, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And so we have what's called the hour of honor in the Greek. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 14. I want to show you this because I want you to see what God does. God blesses us, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, with all spiritual blessings. Is that, is that not true? Well, watch what he says in verse number 14. He says, the Holy Spirit, which is the earnest of our inheritance until, watch this, the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Hallelujah. What are you saying here? in essence is the Holy Spirit is our earnest. 
when you buy a house, right before you buy the house, to let the, 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 the seller know that you're serious about buying the house, they ask you for something called earnest money. Earnest money is not the full purchase price, but it is enough to say, I'm serious about this house. When you give someone earnest money, that's like saying, I'm guaranteeing I'm going to pay the rest. What the Lord says spiritually is, when I gave you the Holy Spirit and you obeyed the gospel, according to Acts chapter 5, verse 32, and Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he says, when you receive the Holy Spirit, that was my down payment that you are my child. And I redeemed you. Now that word redeem is a powerful word. Apologosis in the Greek. It literally means to pay a ransom. That means you are, you, you, you are owned by somebody else. The devil owned you. But Jesus paid the price. Amen. And here's another thing. He didn't just pay the price. He paid the price that you couldn't afford. That's what that word means. It means to pay a price that you and I couldn't pay. When Jesus died on the cross, John chapter 19, verse 28 to verse 30, the Bible says, he took the cup. He said, it is
these pharisaical rules. And I'm not saying you gotta cut a fool when you're in the Lord's house. I'm not saying that. This is the other extreme. Oh, you just trying to say you do that. No, I'm not saying that either. But you're not gonna retard my freedom in Christ. Amen. I'm going to say amen, I'm going to say amen. If I'm going to say it 20 times, I'm going to say it 20 times. And then you say something about it. Because you're not free. Not to act a fool, but to praise God. You will never find a passage in the Bible that says praise is quiet. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. Folks going to palm leaves. People say, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. You know, they ask people in church Christ, shh, that's why they know us. You can't be wrong with that. Calm down, calm down. You know, Jesus said, you're right. You can't sing now because you know, you're out of order. No, you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, you tell them to shut up. I'm going to make those rocks cry. Right Amen. I got more Bible for crying out than you got to be quiet. <laughs> now I'm not trying to, you know, preach praise. If you if you people are quiet, they praise their God. But don't get upset with somebody that praises our life. Stop, stop doing that. Stop doing that. That's a side point. That's a side But anyway, going back to my main point, I want you to see this. He says we are saved by hope. Earnest expectation. But Paul's trying to drive home here. So we'll find out. This, 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 this lesson. I want you to see what Paul says. Paul says when you've got hope, it's a fixed position. My eyes are fixed on God. And no man, no two-legged, two-legged, four-legged man is going to keep me from getting to heaven. Why? Because my hope is God. And as long as my hope is God, I can't worry about what you do. Because you fail. You, you'll love me one day and hate me the next. I can't deal with you. I can deal with God. The Bible says he's the same Yesterday, today, and forever. I know when he says he loves me, he loves me for me. All simple me, all bad, talking, dumb me. But he loves me, so I got hope. But then look at, look at the next verse, verse 25. He says, but if we hope for what we see, then do we with patience or endurance, hope for more that, do we, do we wait for it? See, when you have hope for something, you don't mind enduring. And the word doesn't mean to, to bring and bear it. See, we think hope, endurance means, oh, yeah, they get on my nerve. No, no, no. When people get on your nerve, this is what I learned as a child of God. I learned this recently because uh, I have a car issue. And, 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 and if you notice, I didn't drive a car today because they can get in my car. But, 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 uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy. I was told, why don't you call me up and give me, I'm going to give a piece of my mind, but I told him already, if my car is scratched, being on this, I'm getting a new one on you. <laughs> See, I got hope. I'm not going to be a oh my God, I'm going to get a new one. I'm going to get a new one, I'm saying what I pay, I'm paying notes all right now. And that's my hope. But see, sometimes you got to focus on God and things of God because if you focus on man and things of man, you lose your hope. Oh, you lose it quick. So now, you see, you look at that man, he just, well, he's going to be a Christian, man. He treated me wrong. And I'm not coming back to that church. He treated, listen, man, get your eyes off of him. You can't change wrong folks. You, you let God deal with them. But in the interim, don't you get dragged down. You can ask for God. Brothers and sisters, I've said enough. If you're a child of God and you need prayer this morning, you can ask for God to remove your strength. You're not hope. You're not hope. If you're not a member of the Lord's church, I want you to listen very carefully because there's some things that you have to do to become a child of God. The Bible says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be saved. It doesn't take a PhD to understand. Bible says that you do not repent, you shall like my parents. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Bible says, faith come by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. There are some things that you and I must do, but God has already done the rest. We respond to the gospel call because God has already prepared 
He's already prepared salvation for you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. He says, so that where I am, you shall be also. And if it were not true, I would not have told you so. Your salvation is already prepared. All you have to do is come down and receive it out of me. Do you want to do that this morning? Is there somebody in the audience that does not know Jesus and the saving of their soul? You can do it right now. You can do it right now as we stand and sing the song of invitation. Yeah.